Section 5 of the Watergate Report, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 2, Section 5. I. The Hertz Corporation. In the fall of 1971, Donald Petrie, a former president of Hertz International Division, retired from a New York investment firm and became associated as a volunteer worker with the Washington, D.C. campaign office of Senator Edmund Muskie. In a committee interview, Petrie stated that, at the request of Deputy Campaign Chairman George Mitchell, he had made arrangements with Hertz and Avis for the leasing of rental cars to key Muskie campaign workers. Petrie stated that the reason he sought an accommodation from the car rental companies was the fact that the key Muskie campaign workers were not being afforded the usual discount rate in renting cars, were experiencing difficulty in obtaining reservations for rental cars, and, because of the lack of credit cards, were being required to tie up inordinate amounts of cash for the purpose of making rental car deposits. Petrie stated that he called Robert A. Smalley, then president of the Hertz Corporation, and requested special credit cards by which rental cars might be made available, with the billing to be held in abeyance until the primary campaigns were ended. Petrie stated that he volunteered to be a guarantor of the rental car bills. Smalley, now retired from the Hertz Corporation, in his appearance before the committee on November 20, 1973, described the telephone conversation with Petrie as being one in which Petrie asked if Hertz could make available cars free of charge for the use of the Muskie campaign. Smalley stated that he responded to Petrie's inquiry and told him that he could not provide free rental cars and that Petrie, as a former Hertz corporate officer, should know that to grant such a request would be in violation of company policy. Smalley further testified that Petrie neither challenged his response nor gave any indication that his request had been misunderstood. Smalley stated that he referred Petrie to Saul Adidon, the vice president and general counsel of the Hertz Corporation, and concurrently advised Adidon to assist Petrie with his need for rental cars. Smalley stated that he did not provide Adidon with any specific instructions, nor did he relate to Adidon his understanding of the telephone conversation with Petrie. At this point, it appears that Smalley and Petrie discontinued any participation in the matter and were not advised of any of the subsequent events. Saul M. Adidon, who was granted immunity on November 13, 1973, testified before the committee that upon the general instructions of the Hertz Corporation president, Smalley, he did provide rental cars to selected Muskie campaign workers, the names having been furnished by Petrie. Adidon testified that he made rental car reservations through his office, and that the bills for these car rentals incurred by the designated Muskie campaign workers were sent directly to his office. He stated, I accumulated the bills, anticipating that eventually they would be written off by Hertz. By May of 1972, Adidon was holding car rental bills which, to the best of his recollection, aggregated to about $8,000 or $9,000 although the amount billed was only $4,103.29. Anticipating that he would terminate his employment with the Hertz Corporation on or about June 1, 1972, Mr. Adidon addressed himself to the problem of disposing of the musky car rental bills. He stated as follows. Shortly before leaving Hertz in May 1972, and in anticipation of my departure, I attempted to have the accumulated bills in my possession written off. By this time, Mr. Smalley was no longer with Hertz. I went to the controller of Hertz and asked that the bills be written off. While I do not recall specifically my conversation with the controller, I believe that I indicated generally to him that the bills were of a political nature. The controller said that to write them off might cause the auditors of Hertz's parent corporation, RCA, to question him about them. Accordingly, he refused to write the bills off without specific direction of the chief executive of Hertz. Ronald Perman was then chief executive. I went to Mr. Perman and told him about the rentals that had been made on the basis of Mr. Smalley's instructions to me. I told him the amount of the accumulated bills and that the controller would not write them off without Mr. Perman's authorization. Mr. Perman, an accountant himself, 
recognized the controller's reluctance to write off the bills but he also considered them to be an obligation of hertz since the bills could not be written off it was necessary for hertz to take care of their payment in some way mr perman authorized me to have hertz provide funds to outside lawyers to enable them to make contributions to the muskie campaign committee in the amount of the outstanding bills edidin testified that he contacted six new york attorneys and one chicago attorney and asked each of them to send him a contribution for the muskie campaign in return he would approve the payment of their bills for legal services in an amount sufficient to cover not only the amount of their contribution but an amount twenty five to thirty per cent more than the amount of their contribution for the purpose of reimbursing them for their income tax obligation adidin stated that seven attorneys participated individually or through their partner by sending contributions in amounts ranging from three hundred dollars to one thousand dollars for a total of four thousand one hundred and three dollars and twenty nine cents according to adidin the individuals for whom he approved the payment of bills for which no services had been performed were richard m tickton esq edward w malkin esq four seventy seven madison avenue new york new york one double o two two one thousand dollars barton d eaton esq eleven east forty fourth street suite eleven hundred new york new york one double o one seven one thousand dollars john l murray esq murray and mawinney p c two thirty five mamaronac avenue white plains new york one o six o five three hundred dollars matthew l lifflander esq care of weiss bronston rosenthal heiler and schwartzman two ninety five madison avenue new york new york one double o one seven one thousand dollars larsh b mawinney esq murray and mawinney p c two three five mamaronac avenue white plains new york one o six o five three hundred dollars subtotal three thousand six hundred dollars attorney as to whom no evidence of reimbursement was determined five hundred dollars total forty one hundred dollars though uncertain in his testimony concerning the exact dates and amounts of the bills he approved for payment to the participating attorneys Adidin did identify certain bills and vouchers which he testified bore the characteristics of bills paid for which no services were performed each of the following bills identified by Adidin bore his signature and approval of payment the initials of hertz board chairman r j perman were within the pertinent time frame and were in an amount compatible with his recollection regarding the identity of the attorney from whom he solicited a contribution edgar w malkin and richard m ticklin law partners fifteen hundred dollars may seventeenth nineteen seventy two matthew l lifflander fifteen hundred dollars may eighteenth nineteen seventy two barton d eaton nine hundred and fifty dollars may twenty second nineteen seventy two john l murray and larsh b mawinney law partners nine hundred dollars may nineteenth 1972. In an attempt to determine that there was a viable Muskie committee to which the solicited contributions might be sent, Adidin testified that, I spoke with Matthew Lifflander, a former employee of Hertz, then an attorney in private practice, who was active in the Muskie campaign, and asked him to arrange that the campaign committee would utilize any contributions provided to pay the outstanding bills edidin testified that he collected the contributions from the attorneys and that the checks were made payable to the name or names of muskie committees furnished by lifflander he gave the checks which totaled thirty one hundred dollars to matthew lifflander in may of nineteen seventy two and at the same time asked lifflander if he would contribute one thousand dollars so that the full amount of the outstanding muskie car rental bills could be paid Subsequently, Lifflander did provide to Adidin a check from a Washington, D.C. Muskie committee payable to the Hertz Corporation in the amount of $4,103.29. This check was dated May 30, 1972. Adidin asserts that the difference between the $3,100 he gave Lifflander and the $4,103.29 represents Lifflander's contribution 
although Adidon has no personal knowledge regarding how Lifflander's contribution was made. Testifying before the committee on November 19, 1973, Mr. Lifflander stated that not only did he not submit a bill to the Hertz Corporation for which no service was performed, but that he did not make any contribution subsequent to April 20, 1972, well before the plan described by Adidon was formulated. He states that he told Adidon in May of 1972 that he would arrange for his $1,000 contribution made on April 20, 1972, to be allocated to the payment of the Muskie car rental bills, and that he made no further contribution as a result of his contact with Adidon. When asked about a report of the Muskie Committee signed by Lifflander and filed with the GAO, which lists him as making a $1,000 contribution on June 7, 1972, Lifflander said that the entry was a clerical error. In his testimony, Lifflander also stated that in the spring of 1972, Saul M. Adidon, then vice president and general counsel with Hertz, called and asked him for assistance in collecting from the Muskie Campaign Committee money to pay the Hertz car rental bills. Lifflander referred Adidon to Stanley Goldstein, who was a volunteer worker with the Muskie organization handling the settlement of debts. Subsequently, Adidon contacted Lifflander again and told him that he had an agreement with the Muskie people in Washington that they would pay the Hertz car rental bills if he, Adidon, succeeded in raising contributions in an equal amount to the outstanding bills. Shortly thereafter, May of 1972, Lifflander met with Adidon in his office and received from Adidon several checks payable to a Muskie committee. At this meeting, Adidon told him that he was about $1,000 short and requested that Lifflander contribute $1,000 to make up the difference. Lifflander states that he told Adidon he had just contributed $1,000 in April of 1972, and that, in view of his recent contribution, he would ask the Muskie people to allocate that $1,000 contribution to the payment of the Hertz car rental bills. Lifflander said it was probably on the same occasion that he received the Muskie contribution checks from Adidon, that he discussed and received approval from Adidon for the payment of a legal bill in the amount of $1,500. On June 1, 1972, Lifflander transmitted to Hertz a Muskie committee check in the amount of $4,103.29. Lifflander denied any participation other than receiving the contributions from Saul Adidon and subsequently furnishing a Muskie committee check in payment to Hertz. Lifflander did submit a legal bill to the Hertz Corporation in May of 1972. The amount of this bill was $1,500. The explanation furnished by Lifflander for this bill was that he was under contract to the Hertz Corporation to provide a study on Hertz franchising. This contract was entered into in the fall of 1971, and, as he began his work in 1972, he realized that an independent section with regard to the laws applicable to franchises should be included in the study. On the day that he met with Adidon to pick up the checks payable to the Muskie committees, he explained to Adidon the need for this legal section in the study he was doing. According to Lifflander, Adidon agreed with him that a proper fee for this additional work would be $1,500. Lifflander states that he wrote a 43-page legal section a copy of which has been provided to the committee. Lifflander denies that this $1,500 bill submitted to Hertz in May of 1972 is in any way connected with, nor was the money used for, the subsequent payment of car rental bills by the Muskie Committee. Gerald Shapiro, president of Hertz, testified before the committee that in late 1971 he had engaged Matthew Lifflander to prepare a general business report on franchising for the Hertz Corporation. He stated that the payment for the study was authorized by him in a total amount of $5,000, one-third of which was to be paid in advance and the remaining two-thirds upon completion of the study. Shapiro stated that no additional payments were authorized by him, and that, in his opinion, it would have been unusual for any Hertz official who was not a party to the original contract to have authorized additional payments to Lifflander. Barton D. Eaton, a New York attorney 
who was alleged by Saladin to have been involved in the plan to raise campaign contributions for the purpose of paying musky car rental bills, testified before the committee under grant of immunity on December 4, 1973. Eaton corroborated the allegation made by Adidin that he had made a contribution in the amount of $1,000 through Adidin to the Muskie Election Committee. He stated that he had contributed a $500 check dated May 19, 1972, and that at his, Eaton's, request, his wife also contributed a $500 check to the Muskie Election Committee, and that the date of her check was May 18, 1972. Eaton stated that, though his recollection was unclear, he knows that he submitted bills to the Herbst Corporation in a total amount of $1,450, one thousand of which was to reimburse him for his campaign contribution, and $450 of which would be allocated for his income tax liability. Eaton stated that it was his recollection that, rather than submitting one bill in the amount of $1,450, he had submitted two bills one for $950 and the other for $500. Eaton stated that he had no specific recollection with regard to the delivery of the two $500 contributions. However, he believes that he delivered them directly to Adidin's office and had given them to Adidin or to his secretary. The contribution checks supplied to Adidin by the Eatons were made payable to the Muskie Election Committee, as were all of the other checks. These checks were deposited to the account of the Muskie Campaign Committee, as evidenced by both the official reports submitted to the U.S. General Accounting Office and by the letters dated June 1, 1972, which Mr. Lifflander sent in acknowledgment of the contributions. All of the contribution checks obtained by Adidin were made payable to the Muskie Election Committee, albeit erroneously in the opinion of Lifflander, as was his $1,000 check dated April 18, 1972. In connection with his $1,000 contribution check, dated April 18, 1972, to the Muskie Election Committee, Lifflander stated, You see, whatever committee name was used, I could put in any bank account, as indeed my own check, made out erroneously to Muskie Election Committee, and I found out today there was no such thing as a bank account committee, went into the Muskie for president. To demonstrate that he made no contribution in May or June of 1972, Lifflander submitted hundreds of financial documents relating to the Muskie campaign, as well as his personal bank and other financial records. An examination of the financial records provided the committee of the Muskie Campaign Finance Committee by Lifflander reflected no indication of a $1,000 contribution by him and, in fact, no unidentified items equal to or totaling $1,000. The only substantial items not attributed to specific contributors were a deposit of $125 on May 11, 1972, and deposits of $500 and $100 on June 15, 1972. Lifflander also provided what he averred were all his bank records for his personal and law firm accounts during the relevant period. There was no check to any Muskie committee in May or June of 1972, and there were no checks payable to cash or other withdrawals that could be viewed as the source of cash for a $1,000 contribution by him. Matthew L. Lifflander submitted an affidavit dated April 19, 1974, with over 100 pages of exhibits in support of his position. Lifflander's affidavit notes that GAO reports attributed two contributions to him to the Muskie campaign, $1,000 on April 20, 1972, and $1,000 on June 7, 1972. He continues, It was not until after my testimony before the select committee that I discovered I was listed on the GAO reports as having made two $1,000 contributions to the Muskie for President campaign during the year 1972 that is, on April 20, 1972, and on June 7, 1972. The entry for June 7, 1972, was not called to my attention either when I testified before the Select Committee or before the Internal Revenue Service. I want to take this opportunity to reiterate my categorical denial that I made any contribution to the Muskie campaign during the year 1972, 
except for the contribution listed in my name for April 20, 1972. This contribution was clearly made at least one month prior to my conversations with Mr. Adidon. It was made to the Muskie for President Campaign Committee, located in Washington, D.C., and was mailed to the Washington Campaign Office. Indeed, it was listed in the GAO reports rendered by the Muskie for President Washington Campaign Office. The second $1,000 contribution, which was allegedly made on June 7, 1972, was simply never made by me, and its inclusion in the GAO report is in error. The source of the information regarding this second contribution is the GAO reports rendered by the Muskie Committee in New York State, of which I was treasurer and which I signed. While my name appears in that report as having contributed $1,000 on June 7, 1972, the supporting bank and committee records clearly indicate that such a contribution was neither made nor received. On the subject of services provided by him to Hertz for the $1,500, Lifflander stated, When I testified before the select committee, I stated that when Mr. Adidon contacted me in May 1972, it was the first time that I learned that he was leaving Hertz at the end of that month. I, therefore, took the occasion of my meeting with him to discuss a professional matter on which I was working for the Hertz Corporation. In November 1971, I had been formally retained by the Hertz Corporation to do a consultant study of the potential for expanding corporate franchising activities. This study was contracted for by a letter dated November 11, 1971, a copy of which was previously supplied to the committee. The fee I was to be paid for this study was in the amount of $5,000, of which I was paid $1,500 retainer on December 28, 1971. As this study proceeded during the fall of 1971 and the first half of 1972, it became obvious that in order to make the study complete, extensive legal research and analysis with regard to a survey of the existing laws affecting franchising in several states needed to be included in this study. As the letter agreement with the Hertz Corporation will indicate, no such legal analysis was agreed to at that time. This was so because the need for such legal research and analysis was not apparent to either me or Hertz when we originally entered into the contract. I, therefore, discussed with Mr. Adidon in his capacity as general counsel of the Hertz Corporation the need for additional compensation for me in order to complete the legal phase of this study. Mr. Adidon agreed that this was necessary and that an amount of $1,500 would be a fair compensation and that this sum would be paid as an additional retainer. Edward W. Malkin, an attorney referred to by Adidon as having made a reimbursed contribution of $1,000, submitted the following statement to the committee concerning his alleged involvement. I wish to advise the committee that, as to any monies received by me from the Hertz Corporation in May 1972, I had no personal knowledge that the receipt thereof was part of any such arrangement. Accordingly, if such arrangement existed, I could not and did not knowingly participate in it. Malkin's partner, Richard Tickton, through his attorney, called to the attention of the committee that Mr. Tickton is an attorney with an unblemished reputation in the community and at the bar, and to refer specifically to him in the report would undoubtedly have severe and potentially prejudicial after-effects upon him, his family, and his career. The testimony, by various of the principals involved, is unclear, equivocal, and contradictory. John L. Murray and Larsh B. Mawinney, law partners in White Plains, New York, each of whom was alleged to have made a $300 contribution reimbursed by Hertz, submitted affidavits which recited that they left the Hertz Corporation to practice law early in 1973, and that Hertz has throughout been one of the firm's principal clients. Murray's affidavit continues, Mr. Adidon has testified before this committee that in May 1972 he asked various attorneys, including Mr. Mahwini and me, to contribute certain sums to the Muskie Campaign Committee. There is no dispute about that. The donations made by Mr. Mahwini and me and the manner in which they were made are matters of record. 
they were personal donations in every sense however mr adidon has further testified it was his intent that the attorneys he contacted would submit for his approval bills for services not actually rendered as a means of obtaining reimbursement and that he communicated this intent to the attorneys at the time to the best of my recollection no such intent or plan was communicated to me by mr adidon or anyone else i categorically deny the implication that i participated in any such scheme and likewise deny that my firm ever submitted a bill for services not rendered to the hertz corporation or any other client five mr lifflander has testified before this committee with reference to a research project he had undertaken for hertz on which he was working at the time of these events mr lifflander's testimony as to his consultations with mr mcwinney and me at about that same time and the services we rendered in connection with his final report on the subject to hertz is completely factual our daily time sheets diary entries expense reports and other office records all contemporaneously made fully substantiate mr lifflander's testimony in this respect and in fact provide further details consistent in all respects with his testimony that he was apparently unable to recall in summary i have never been reimbursed for my contribution to the nineteen seventy two muskie campaign in any form or manner whatsoever and never sought or expected to be reimbursed my firm has never submitted a bill to or received payment from the hertz corporation or any other person or entity for other than bona fide professional services actually rendered and expenses and disbursements actually incurred in the client's behalf mehuini's affidavit substantially adopts the affidavit of murray two the facts recited by mr murray are correct to my personal knowledge and if i were called as a witness i would so testify i have no direct personal knowledge however of what was said by mr murray and mr adidon in their telephone conversation initiated by mr adidon and suggesting that we make a political contribution end of section five section six of the watergate report volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 2, Section 6. J. Lehigh Valley Cooperative Farmers, Incorporated. Lehigh Valley Cooperative Farmers, Incorporated, Lehigh Valley, a corporation based in Allentown, Pennsylvania, representing nearly 1,000 dairymen in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland, made a $50,000 political contribution from its corporate funds in April 1972 to the President's campaign in exchange for the appearance of Agriculture Secretary Earl Butts at the Cooperative's annual dinner in April 1972. The corporate contribution was made in cash and was subsequently covered up by certain co-op officials, and it was not publicly reported by the Finance Committee to re-elect the President until more than a year later. Receipt of the contribution and the Secretary's appearance were arranged with the knowledge of top campaign officials, including Magruder and possibly Mitchell, and the cash went to a secret fund used by LaRue to pay the original Watergate defendants. In connection with this contribution, the cooperative and former co-op officials, Richard L. Allison and Francis X. Carroll, have pleaded guilty to violating federal law prohibiting corporate political contributions. This matter is discussed in greater detail below. In early 1972, on behalf of Lehigh Valley, Francis X. Carroll, its Washington, D.C. representative, extended an invitation to Vice President Agnew to attend the co-op's annual shareholders' dinner meeting scheduled for April 20, 1972. According to Richard L. Allison, then President and General Manager of the co-op, Carroll told the co-op board of directors that $35,000 was needed to secure the vice president's attendance, and the board approved an honorarium of that amount for the vice president. The Lehigh Valley invitation to the vice president was approved by John Mitchell. However, the vice president was already scheduled to make several political appearances in that area, and his office notified the co-op that he would be unable to attend the meeting. 
carroll apparently would not take no for an answer after receipt of the vice president's refusal letter carroll contacted certain members of congress to obtain their support in his efforts directly referring in at least one instance to a possible contribution in a letter dated february twenty eighth nineteen seventy two to senator hugh scott carroll explained his attempt to secure the vice president and stated that allison had authorized him to contribute thirty thousand dollars to the republican national committee and or the president's re-election campaign senator scott's office passed on the request to the crp scheduling office under the direction of herbert porter who in turn assigned the matter to his assistant j curtis herge herge coordinated the surrogate program which involved a total of thirty five cabinet officers senators congressmen and federal agency officials making political appearances in the nineteen seventy two campaign as surrogates for the president as part of his responsibilities for the surrogate program herge was responsible for scheduling in the nineteen seventy two primary states one of which was pennsylvania whose presidential primary was to be held on april twenty fifth five days after the scheduled co-op dinner herge says that when he was assigned the lehigh valley matter he contacted curtis ur one of senator scott's aides who informed him that carroll was offering one hundred thousand dollars for an appearance by the vice president although ur denies knowing of an offer of one hundred thousand dollars or any other amount directly in exchange for such an appearance he acknowledges that carroll implied to him that a contribution would be made later if he was successful in obtaining agnew's appearance herge says he reported the offer to magruder who apparently took an increased interest in lehigh valley's request john damgard mr agnew's scheduling aide says that four or five days before the april twentieth dinner magruder asked him to see if the vice president would reconsider his earlier refusal and attend the dinner calling the invitation a high priority damgard does not recall if magruder specifically referred to the contribution in any event the vice president again refused on or about the twentieth a last-minute effort was made to secure a substitute speaker for agnew herge says that when he notified carroll that the vice president could not attend carroll told him that for someone of less prominence the contribution would not be one hundred thousand dollars but would be smaller from thirty five thousand dollars to seventy five thousand dollars according to herge carroll offered to contribute the money to the rnc but herge says he instructed him that the money should go to the fcrp herge then contacted several surrogates and only secretary of agriculture earl butts did not flatly refuse herge says that he checked with carroll who told him that the thirty five thousand dollars to seventy five thousand dollar offer was still open for someone such as secretary butts herge then notified magruder who said he would talk to mitchell to convince butts to make the appearance later that day herge was notified by magruder that butts had indeed agreed to attend the dinner and that herge was to ask carroll for fifty thousand dollars herge said magruder told him don't let it fall through herge did not he says he called carroll and told him that butts would attend the affair that evening and he recommended a fifty thousand dollar contribution according to herge carroll said it would be in cash but that he only had twenty five thousand dollars available for delivery that day Carroll has given federal investigators a different account of these contacts with Herge. Carroll says that Herge contacted him and told him that Lehigh Valley would have to pay $100,000 for Agnew, but that he vigorously refused this offer. On April 19th, Herge allegedly told him that Agnew could not attend, but that Secretary Butts could for $50,000 in cash, $25,000 on the day of the dinner, and $25,000 immediately thereafter carroll says that he reluctantly agreed whoever generated the idea of a fifty thousand dollar contribution in exchange for butts's appearance it is undisputed that it was made in cash during the ensuing week or two on the afternoon of the twentieth before departing washington for the dinner carroll delivered twenty five thousand dollars in cash to the messenger sent by herge james mccord the crp security officer and william minshall a crp employee and then met secretary butts at the airport and accompanied him to allentown the site of the meeting don brock butts's assistant who accompanied him to the dinner says that both he and the secretary were aware that lehigh valley people had made a contribution 
but they were not aware of the source the twenty five thousand dollars was given to porter who kept it in his office safe at crp hirsch says that following the dinner at porter's insistence he contacted carroll several times about the remaining twenty five thousand dollars according to hirsch carroll finally made the second twenty five thousand dollar cash payment in early may nineteen seventy two to hirsch at crp headquarters carroll obtained both twenty five thousand dollar payments from the corporation in the form of checks payable to him which he cashed allison approved both payments authorization for the second payment was never sought or obtained from the board george buchanan lehigh valley's former comptroller asserts that an effort was made to conceal the contribution for approximately one year by disguising the payment in the company's records the contribution was charged to corporate expense accounts and at one point was even treated as a loan to carroll although allison says he insisted that the second payment be treated from the outset as a loan to be repaid by carroll from monthly retainer payments of three thousand dollars from the co-op no note was obtained from carroll until june nineteen seventy three more than a year later and after publicity about the matter arose and buchanan says that the payment was never recouped from carroll the cash contribution was also not reported by the president's re-election campaign organization until more than a year after its receipt according to porter and herge magruder said that stans wanted the money to go to the fcrp and they transferred it to hugh sloan treasurer of fcrp almost immediately after the second payment was delivered by carroll in may nineteen seventy two in october stans asked herge about the contribution and herge explained it to him herge says that at that point stan said oh yes that must be the money sloan told me about we will have to return it because it's corporate money herge and porter both deny any knowledge that the money came from corporate funds they say that they understood that a wealthy member of the pew family of the sun oil company and connected with lehigh valley had donated the funds and that they briefly referred to that fact at the time of the transfer to sloan in may nineteen seventy two sloan says that porter told him only that the money was contributed through a washington attorney by a donor who wanted to remain anonymous sloan says that he asked stans in may nineteen seventy two about reporting the contribution but that he was unable to obtain any further information accordingly he did not include it in the may thirty first f c r p report to g a o or in subsequent reports the money together with an additional thirty one thousand dollars cash was transferred to larue in july nineteen seventy two shortly after the watergate break-in most of which was later paid to the original watergate defendants despite magruder's and possibly mitchell's involvement in the contribution in may nineteen seventy two and stan's knowledge of it no later than october and possibly as early as may nineteen seventy two the contribution was not reported by f c r p to g a o as required under the federal election campaign act of nineteen seventy one until june tenth nineteen seventy three thereafter federal authorities investigated the contribution allison and carroll left lehigh valley and in may nineteen seventy four lehigh valley allison and carroll pleaded guilty to violating federal law prohibiting corporate campaign contributions on may sixth nineteen seventy four lehigh valley pleaded guilty to one count of violating federal law prohibiting a corporate campaign contribution eighteen u s c six ten and was fined five thousand dollars on may seventeenth nineteen seventy four allison pleaded guilty to a non-wilful violation of the same law and was fined one thousand dollars which was suspended and allison was placed on unsupervised probation for one month on may twenty eighth nineteen seventy four carroll pleaded guilty to a non-wilful violation of aiding and abetting an individual to violate the same law and was placed on unsupervised probation for one month k minnesota mining and manufacturing company minnesota mining and manufacturing company better known as three m made contributions from corporate funds to three presidential candidates during the nineteen seventy two campaign president nixon's re-election bid received two contributions one of six thousand dollars and the other thirty thousand dollars while two democratic contenders hubert humphrey and wilbur mills received one thousand dollars each 
as related by 3m officials in staff interviews the monies used in these transactions came from a secret cash fund kept in the safe of erwin hansen 3m's vice president of finance although a political fund has been in existence at 3m since the 1950s the fund under hansen's custody had its origin in 1964. at that time hansen was requested by bert s cross then president and chief operating officer of 3m to find a new method for raising funds for public relations the initial method used to raise money for the political contribution fund was obtained by overstating prepaid insurance this was accomplished by withdrawing money from a corporate bank account and debiting an internal insurance account the funds were transferred to a swiss bank using regular commercial banking procedures the funds held on deposit were withdrawn as required in 1967, according to Hansen, he and Cross decided that a new source was needed. They met with Dr. T. Gutstein, a Swiss attorney and consultant for 3M. It was proposed that Gutstein submit false billings for services to 3M and, after payment, return the proceeds in cash to Hansen. Gutstein agreed to provide the funds, although he was not told of the intended use. In the fall of 1967, Hansen said he requested $25,000 from Gutstein, who sent 3M a billing for that amount. Hansen approved payment, a check was issued, and Gutstein returned the proceeds in $100 bills to Hansen by insured mail. In April 1968 and May 1969, similar transactions took place, each involving $50,000. After the $125,000 was raised through Gutstein in 1969, Hansen stated that he told Cross that this method of raising money should be discontinued. He related that at that time he believed that only he and Cross were aware that the fund consisted entirely of corporate funds. In November 1970, Harry Heltzer became chairman of the board and chief executive officer. Hansen informed Heltzer of the existence of the fund, but not of its source. He explained to Heltzer that all expenditures from the fund required the chairman of the board's approval. In an affidavit given to this committee, Heltzer said, speaking of the fund, that when the 1972 contributions were made, I was not aware of its origin, and, while I had strong suspicions that the fund contained corporate funds, I did not make an inquiry as to its source probably because i did not want to know the answer on november second nineteen seventy one monies from the corporate fund were used to purchase six one thousand dollar tickets to a salute the president dinner the second contribution of thirty thousand dollars to the nixon campaign is described in helzer's affidavit on march twenty sixth nineteen seventy two a contribution was made from corporate funds to the committee to re-elect the president when Wilbur Bennett, 3M's Director of Civic Affairs, delivered $30,000 in cash to Mr. Maury Stans. About March 1972, Mr. Bennett and Mr. Stans had a conversation, during which the latter suggested that 3M executives consider giving a contribution to the committee to re-elect the president. In a later conversation, Mr. Stans suggested to Mr. Bennett that the contribution be in an amount between $75,000 and $100,000, which amount was comparable to anticipated contributions from other enterprises about the size of 3M. Mr. Bennett tells me that at no time did Mr. Stans assert any overt pressure on him for any contribution, nor was I at any time ever aware of any such pressure. I never did discuss this contribution with Mr. Stans. About March 15, 1972, Bennett discussed Stans' request with me. We agreed that the amount requested was excessive, in light of previous contributions to the Nixon campaign by 3M executives, and the fact that another fundraiser for the president was scheduled for the fall of 1972, we decided that the $30,000 balance would come from a political contribution fund in the custody of Mr. Hansen, Director of Finance. Helser initialed an authorization for Hansen to give Bennett $30,000 in cash. On March 26, 1972, Bennett met with Stans in his St. Paul, Minnesota hotel suite. At that time, he delivered to Stans the $30,000 in cash, along with a $3,000 check drawn on the personal account of Helzer. 
subsequently about fifteen thousand dollars in contributions from other three m executives was forwarded to the committee to re-elect the president in the spring of nineteen seventy three when it became apparent that the common cause suit would require disclosure of all pre april seventh nineteen seventy two contributions stans requested a meeting with bennett according to helzer's affidavit the following events took place on may twenty second nineteen seventy three bennett met with stans in washington pursuant to his request and stans informed him that it was imperative that he have a list of the names of the persons identified with the thirty thousand dollar contributions bennett returned to st paul and drew up a list of twenty nine persons associated with three m who had made political contributions in the past and arbitrarily allotted a specific amount to each name the persons who were named in the list were of course not the source of the funds and they had not been consulted concerning the use of their names bennett sent the list to stans the first week of june on july eighth nineteen seventy three kenneth parkinson the attorney for the committee to re-elect the president communicated a request to bennett to confirm the accuracy of the previously disclosed list bennett informed helzer of the situation including the arbitrary preparation of the list helzer ordered the legal staff to conduct an investigation into the source of the hansen fund they employed outside counsel and it was ascertained that corporate funds were involved at three m s request the thirty thousand dollar cash contribution was returned by the finance committee to re-elect the president no other requests have been made by the company for the return of corporate funds illegally contributed on october seventeenth nineteen seventy three three m corporation and harry helzer entered pleas of guilty to violation of the federal corrupt practices act the company was fined three thousand dollars and mr helzer five hundred dollars three m officials have indicated that one hundred and thirty six thousand dollars was remaining in the fund and that it has since been returned to the company end of section six section seven of the watergate report volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org final report of the senate select committee on presidential campaign activities volume two l northrop corporation on may one nineteen seventy four in u s district court washington d c northrop corporation a major government defense contractor admitted that one hundred fifty thousand dollars in corporate funds had been used in making contributions to the nixon re-election campaign during nineteen seventy two in addition to the corporation two of its officers thomas v jones chief executive officer and james allen vice president and assistant to the president each entered a plea of guilty to violations of the law in connection with the disbursements of corporate funds for political contributions the information contained in the indictments to which the defendants pleaded guilty is in direct contradiction with the information supplied by jones allen and others to this committee during the fall of nineteen seventy three footnote in september nineteen seventy three committee questionnaires for corporate officers and individuals were sent to jones and james wilson senior vice president finance the questionnaires were returned signed and dated september twenty one nineteen seventy three question six in the corporate officer questionnaire asked quote, did any of your companies make any contribution out of corporate funds directly or indirectly to any political candidate committee for a candidate political party or firm or person on behalf of any political candidate committee or party in the nineteen seventy two presidential campaign End quote. to this jones answered quote, no as to northrop corporation and its subsidiaries End quote. and wilson replied quote, no as to the best of my knowledge and belief End quote. jones claimed that he contributed ninety eight thousand dollars to the nixon re-election effort 
and Wilson stated he made a $20,000 donation. During October 1973, Alan Jones, Wilson, and F.W. Lloyd, another corporate vice president, made themselves available for unsworn staff interviews. All of these men maintained that they had no knowledge of any contributions from corporate funds. At that time, these men represented their pre-April 7, 1972 contributions as follows. Tom V. Jones, President, $45,000. James Allen, Vice President in Charge of Finance and Treasurer, $15,000. F. W. Lloyd, Vice President in Charge of Operation, $20,000. James Wilson, Vice President, $20,000. Total, $100,000. In addition to this committee, Jones, among others, also represented to the GAO, the FBI, and the grand jury that the $100,000 contribution was part of a personal commitment unrelated to the corporation. Jones represented that the post-April 7 contribution of $50,000 came from a personal cash fund which he kept. End footnote. The transaction as it now evolves. Footnote. The facts recited herein are based primarily on a written account furnished by defendants' counsel to the select committee following the guilty pleas, as well as interviews conducted by committee staff in October 1973. End footnote. Was initiated on February 18, 1972, when Jones was approached by a group consisting of Herbert Kalmbach, Maurice Stans, and Leonard Firestone, chairman of the California FCRP. They asked Jones to make a, quote, sizable contribution, unquote, to the president. Jones, anticipating such a solicitation, had previously discussed with Allen what an appropriate contribution should be. Jones told the fundraisers that he would contribute $50,000. However, they made it apparent that $50,000 would not be considered an appropriate amount and that a person in Jones's position was expected to contribute $100,000. Immediately following this meeting, Jones and Allen met to discuss how $100,000 could be raised. They decided to seek a foreign source and in that regard contacted Stanley Simon of Simon and Associates of New York City. Simon is a, quote, management consultant, unquote, or as he put it in a staff interview, a, quote, doctor for corporations, unquote. Simon told Allen he thought something could be arranged through William Savvy, a European business advisor for Northrop, who had for a number of years been remitting a portion of the Northrop money he received. In late February 1972, Savvy was paid $120,000 by Northrop. The supporting voucher lists the payment as, quote, additional fees and other compensation, unquote. Savvy, per instructions, then had 20 checks of $5,000 each drawn on his account at the International Bank of Luxembourg. The checks were made out to FCRP committees, the names of which had been furnished to Jones by Stans. On or about March 16, 1972, Jones received the 20 checks totaling $100,000. The $100,000 was given to Nixon re-election committees in two deliveries, one of $50,000 to Leonard Firestone in mid-March 1972, and the second, also $50,000, by Jones to FCRP headquarters in Washington, D.C. on April 5, 1972. Sometime in late July 1972, after Kalmbach had been requested by certain White House officials to raise money for payments on behalf of the original Watergate defendants, Jones said he was called by Kalmbach. Kalmbach advised him that there was a need for additional funds and asked if he could come by to discuss this need. On or about July 31, 1972, Kalmbach and Jones met in Jones's office. Kalmbach told Jones he had a, quote, special need, unquote, and Jones agreed to an additional cash contribution. 
at this time both jones and allen were holding other cash funds which had been obtained from savvy jones took twenty five thousand dollars of these funds which were in his possession and asked allen to put in an additional twenty five thousand from the fund which he was holding and delivered the fifty thousand dollars in cash to kalmbach the entire fifty thousand dollars represented northrop corporate funds jones was assured by kalmbach that this payment would be treated secretly and anonymously there is no evidence that jones was aware of the purpose for which this money was used shortly before the election when the common cause suits to disclose pre april seven nineteen seventy two contributors was gaining momentum jones became alarmed that the initial one hundred thousand dollar contribution might be publicly disclosed also about the same time newspapers reported a congressional investigating committee had traced thirty thousand dollars in luxembourg checks obviously a portion of the northrop contribution to the republican campaign kalmbach approached jones on november sixth nineteen seventy two and related that officials of f c r p were concerned that the contribution was from corporate funds kalmbach offered to return the contribution if this was the case but jones emphatically denied corporate funds were involved sometime during this period jones began to conceive a plan to conceal the corporate origin of the one hundred thousand dollar contribution which was put into effect and related to this committee in late nineteen seventy three as the true facts in late nineteen seventy two jones went separately to allen wilson and lloyd and asked that each of them subscribe to a substantial portion of the one hundred thousand dollar contribution it is not completely clear just what the understandings were among jones and wilson and lloyd wilson says that he was asked to commit only a contingent maximum of twenty thousand dollars and that he would not actually have to contribute that much if jones succeeded in persuading others to join the contribution lloyd understood jones initially to ask simply that he front for a twenty thousand dollar portion of the contribution should it be publicly disclosed because of the public relations problems in explaining such a large personal contribution by jones jones and kalmbach met again a short time later the one hundred thousand dollar contribution was again discussed and jones as before represented that the one hundred thousand dollars was not corporate money in addition to kalmbach attorneys for f c r p were also in contact with jones's attorney as a result of the common cause suit apparently as a result of these contacts jones decided that it was necessary to prepare bogus documentation to support this newly fabricated plan jones had wilson lloyd and allen prepare promissory notes backdated to february twenty eighth nineteen seventy two and payable to thomas jones on february twenty eighth nineteen seventy three the wilson and lloyd notes were for twenty thousand dollars and allen's was for fifteen thousand dollars jones prepared a promissory note to william savvy for one hundred thousand dollars at nine per cent per annum which was also backdated to february twenty eighth nineteen seventy two and payable on february twenty eighth nineteen seventy three other supporting documents were also readied jones and allen agreed that they would represent the prior transfer of one hundred twenty thousand dollars to savvy as an advance made in contemplation of substantial new efforts that savvy would be undertaking to market a particular northrop aircraft to nato countries allen and jones also arranged with savvy that the one hundred thousand dollar advance to jones would be repaid and that savvy would return the unused portion of the one hundred twenty thousand dollars in two year-end transactions savvy and one of his european companies returned a total of ninety four thousand dollars correspondence was prepared to explain this return of funds as the result of a failure of the contemplated marketing effort jones then traveled to washington where he presented an f c r p attorney 
with the bogus documentation supporting the contribution. Prior to February 28, 1973, Jones paid his note to Savvy, and the three Northrop officials paid their notes to Jones. Jones and two other officials obtained the funds to repay their notes by taking out short-term loans from local lending institutions, and the other official withdrew funds from his account in a local savings and loan institution to cover his obligation. On several occasions subsequent to their $20,000 payments to Jones, Lloyd and Wilson came to Allen, not Jones, to seek at least a partial reimbursement for their outlays. On March 15, 1973, Allen decided on his own and without consulting Jones to provide each man with $12,000 in cash from the Savvy Fund. He cautioned them to be discreet in depositing the money and told them there would be no further reimbursement. Northrop Corporation and Jones were indicted under Sections 2 and 611, Title 18, United States Code, for consenting to the use of $150,000 in corporate funds for political contributions. Both were fined $5,000. Allen was indicted under Section 610, Title 18, United States Code, for consenting to the payment of $24,000, $12,000 each, to Wilson and Lloyd from corporate funds. Allen was fined $1,000. Northrop and Jones are the first contributors to be charged under 18 U.S.C. 611, which prohibits contributions by corporations doing a substantial portion of their business with the government. Footnote. Section 611. Contributions by firms or individuals contracting with the United States. Whoever, entering into any contract with the United States or any department or agency thereof, either for the rendition of personal services or furnishing any material, supplies, or equipment to the United States or any department or agency thereof, or selling any land or building to the United States or any department or agency thereof, if payment for the performance of such contract or payment for such material, supplies equipment land or building is to be made in whole or in part from funds appropriated by the congress during the period of negotiation for or performance under such contract or furnishing of material supplies equipment land or buildings directly or indirectly makes any contribution of money or any other thing of value or promises expressly or impliedly to make any such contribution to any political party, committee, or candidate for public office, or to any person for any political purpose or use, or whoever knowingly solicits any such contribution from any such person or firm for any such purpose during any such period, shall be fined not more than $5,000, or imprisoned not more than five years, or both. June 25, 1948 End footnote M. Phillips Petroleum Company In February and March 1972, W. W. Keeler, who was then chairman and chief executive officer of the Phillips Petroleum Company, made contributions totaling $100,000 from the corporate funds of Phillips to the Finance Committee for the re-election of the President as a result of solicitations by Maurice Stans and others. Keeler has been quite active in a number of general business and petroleum industry organizations. For example, in 1970, he was chairman of the National Association of Manufacturers has worked with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and has been active in the American Petroleum Institute, the National Petroleum Council, and the Advertising Council, and a member of the Military Petroleum Advisory Board for nine years. Primarily as a result of his active role in these organizations, Keeler had fairly frequent contact with Stans while the latter was Secretary of Commerce. Keeler recalls a particular conversation with Stans which occurred in the latter part of 1971, following a meeting between Stans and a group from the NAM. 
Footnote. After Phillips publicly disclosed its corporate contribution on August 17, 1973, requests were made of counsel for the company to make available for interview the knowledgeable corporate officials. Because of negotiations with the special prosecutor over the disposition of the criminal case, their appearance was postponed until November 20, 1973. On that date, Keeler appeared and, on advice of counsel, pleaded his privilege against self-incrimination. The case against Keeler and the company was disposed of on December 4. Thereafter, at the request of the committee, Keeler provided a verified statement that forms the basis of the discussion of Phillips' corporate contribution. End footnote. Stans told him at that time that he would be leaving the Commerce Department to head President Nixon's fundraising activities for the 1972 campaign, that he expected substantial help from the oil industry, and that he hoped Keeler would assist him in his fundraising efforts. Keeler's response was non-committal. Keeler subsequently had one or two telephone conversations with Stans on this subject in late 1971 or early 1972. He also had calls from Dan Parker of the Parker Pen Company, as well as from Jeremiah Milbank, the chairman of the Republican Finance Committee. At various times, Keeler was asked to take an active role in Republican fundraising, including requests to serve as co-chairman for Nixon fundraising in Oklahoma, as regional co-chairman for Oklahoma, Texas, and Louisiana, and as an industry fundraiser to contact officials of other companies in the petroleum industry. Keeler consistently declined to act as a fundraiser, although, at a later meeting with Stans, he did agree to talk to a number of oil company officials. Keeler reached the conclusion, probably by early 1972, that while he would not solicit contributions for the Nixon campaign, he had no alternative but to make a substantial contribution for Phillips. According to Keeler, he decided that he would try to, quote, get by with a contribution of $75,000. A senior officer of Phillips at that time had custody of cash, which had been generated from foreign transactions of Phillips, which occurred prior to the time that Mr. Keeler became chairman and chief executive officer of the company in September 1968. These funds had apparently been obtained for the specific purpose of use for political contributions, and their disbursement was controlled by the chief executive officer. The official having custody of these funds in 1972 had been given this responsibility shortly before Keeler became chief executive officer. Apparently, neither he nor Keeler had either detailed or first-hand knowledge of their origin, and it is unlikely that more than two other officers of the company were even aware of their existence. In 1972, at Keeler's direction, the officer having custody of these funds provided him with the initial $75,000 and subsequently with an additional $25,000, which he used for the contributions to the Finance Committee for the re-election of the President. Keeler believes that he discussed his decision to make the contribution with one other officer of the company, but simply to inform him as to what Keeler had decided and why. Keeler called Stans and indicated that he expected to be in Washington in early February and would have a package to deliver. Stans said he would be out of town and asked him to deliver it to Lee Nunn of the Finance Committee for the re-election of the President. Keeler came to Washington on February 6, 1972, to attend a White House conference and remained in Washington for a meeting of the National Petroleum Council on February 10, 1972. The first contribution was delivered to Nunn following a meeting with Attorney General John Mitchell, which Keeler believes occurred on either the 9th or 10th. Shortly after making the first contribution, Keeler received another call from Stans, in which Stans again asked for Keeler's help in raising funds from the oil industry. 
keeler believes that stans may have asked him about the likelihood of obtaining contributions from a number of specific individuals in the industry during that conversation in any event they made an appointment to meet later at stans's office in washington to discuss this further this meeting occurred on March 1, 1972, at Stans's office at the Finance Committee for the re-election of the President. Keeler recalls that Stans began by making, quote, quite a speech, unquote, about the oil industry, in which he stated that the oil industry had done very poorly in the 1968 campaign, that it had not made substantial contributions to Nixon, that he had reason to believe that the oil companies in the past had been heavy contributors to political campaigns, and that he expected them to make similar contributions in this campaign. Stans listed a number of people in the oil industry whom he said he did not know or did not know well, and asked whether Keeler did. Keeler said that he did know most of those mentioned. Stans asked if Keeler would contact those whom he knew in behalf of the Finance Committee and solicit a contribution, since he was having difficulty contacting oil industry people. Keeler recalls his commenting, quote, Some of these fellows I can't even get in to see, unquote. Keeler indicated that he was not willing to act as a formal fundraiser or to solicit contributions, but was willing to talk to those whom he knew and urge them to see or talk to Stans when Stans attempted to contact them. Stans said that would be helpful. Keeler expressed the opinion that it would do no good to contact some of those mentioned. For example, he referred to one company president who was antagonistic toward the Nixon administration because of the delays in constructing the Alaskan pipeline. While Keeler recalls that in an earlier conversation Stans had indicated that he wanted $400,000 from each company, at the March 1 meeting, Stans stated that he wanted at least $200,000 from each company and something to the effect that, quote, these companies we are discussing ought to be able to raise that much, unquote. Keeler responded that he would not speak for anyone else, but that $200,000 was out of the question for Phillips. The conversation ended with Stans telling Keeler that if he could not contact Stans, he should see Lee Nunn. Keeler believes that following the meeting with Stans, he talked in person or by phone to most of the oil industry executives suggested at the meeting. All those with whom he talked indicated their willingness to talk to Stans, but almost all either protested that they didn't know whether they could raise the kind of money Stans wanted or indicated that they did not intend to make a contribution. Keeler later was asked and agreed to act as co-chairman for one of the $1,000 per plate Nixon victory dinners in Tulsa, and was listed as co-chairman on the invitations. He and a number of Phillips officers attended. Either as a result of the March 1 meeting with Stans, or as a result of further telephone calls, Keeler decided that it was necessary to make a further contribution of $25,000, bringing the company's total contribution to $100,000. He was scheduled to be in Washington on March 27 and 28, 1972, for the annual Washington Conference of the Advertising Council, and to attend a stag dinner at the White House on March 28. He drew an additional $25,000 in cash, brought it with him to Washington, and delivered it to Nunn, probably on March 28. In anticipation of his normal retirement, Keeler resigned as chief executive officer of Phillips effective January 1, 1973, and as chairman of the board effective April 1, 1973. In April 1973, he retired as an officer of the company, but remained a member of the board, until April 1974. In July 1973, after his retirement, Keeler went to the office of the General Counsel of Phillips and advised him of these contributions and that they had been made from corporate funds. This conversation was reported to William Martin, 
who succeeded Keeler as chief executive officer on January 1, 1973. Martin directed that outside counsel be employed to investigate the circumstances of the contribution and to represent the company. After a preliminary investigation by counsel, the board of directors of Phillips was advised at its meeting on August 13, 1973, that these contributions had been made from corporate funds. The board directed that counsel advise the special prosecutor investigating the 1972 election of these facts and take any steps necessary to secure the refund of the contributions from the Finance Committee to re-elect the president. This was done on August 15, 1973. On August 17, 1973, the $100,000 was refunded to the company by the committee and a press release issued by Phillips reciting these facts in summary form. On December 4, 1973, the special prosecutor filed an information in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, criminal number 998-73, charging the Phillips Petroleum Company and William W. Keeler with non-willful violations of Section 610 of Title 18 of the United States Code, prohibiting corporations from making and corporate officers from consenting to political contributions in federal elections. On that date, both Phillips Petroleum Company and Keeler entered pleas of guilty and were fined $5,000 and $1,000 respectively. End of Section 7 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 8 of The Watergate Report, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 2, Ambassadorships. In a February 25, 1974 news conference, President Nixon denied that his administration was involved in the practice of brokering ambassadorships. He declared, quote, Ambassadorships have not been for sale, and I would not approve an ambassadorship unless the man or woman was qualified clearly apart from his contribution. End quote. That very day, his personal attorney and one of his principal fundraisers, Herbert Kalmbach, became the first person in recent times to be convicted for, quote, selling an ambassadorship, unquote, in violation of Title 18, United States Code, Section 600. On February 25, 1974, Mr. Kalmbach entered a guilty plea to having promised in 1971 then-ambassador to Trinidad and Tobago, J. Fife Symington, a more prestigious European ambassadorship in return for a $100,000 contribution which was to be split between 1970 Republican senatorial candidates designated by the White House and Mr. Nixon's 1972 campaign. A condition of Mr. Kalmbach's agreement to plead guilty was that he be granted immunity from further prosecution in connection with, quote, contributions from persons seeking ambassadorial posts, end quote. Mr. Kalmbach has also advised the committee staff that then-ambassador to Jamaica, Vincent de Roulet, had a similar commitment. Since his re-election on November 7, 1972, Mr. Nixon apparently has had little trouble finding large contributors who were, quote, qualified apart from their contributions, unquote, to be appointed as ambassadors. Since November 7, 1972, Mr. Nixon has appointed 13 non-career ambassadors, Eight of these newly appointed and confirmed ambassadors each had donated a minimum of $25,000, and in the aggregate, they contributed over $706,000 to their appointer's re-election committee. In fact, over $1.8 million in presidential campaign contributions can be attributed in whole or in part to persons holding ambassadorial appointments from the president. Contributions of Ambassadors Appointed by President Nixon 
Adair, E. Ross, Ethiopia, confirmed by Senate, May 11, 1971. No contributions. Annenberg, Walter H., Great Britain, confirmed by Senate, March 13, 1969. $250,000 pre-April 7, 1972, $4,000 post-April 7, 1972, total $254,000. Campbell, James F., El Salvador, confirmed by Senate, February 8, 1974, no contributions. Cato, Henry E., confirmed by Senate, September 29, 1971, $25,000 pre-April 7, 1972, total $25,000. Crow, Philip K., Norway, confirmed by Senate, May 1, 1969, five hundred dollars post april seventh nineteen seventy two total five hundred dollars davis shelby switzerland confirmed by senate may twelve nineteen sixty nine one hundred thousand dollars pre april seventh nineteen seventy two total one hundred thousand dollars de Roulet, vincent jamaica Confirmed by Senate, September 17, 1969, $100,000 pre-April 7, 1972, $3,500 post-April 7, 1972, total $103,500. Dudley, Guilford, Denmark. Confirmed by Senate, May 12, 1969. $2,500 post-April 7, 1972. Total, $2,500. Eisenhower, John, Belgium. Confirmed by Senate, March 13, 1969. No contributions. Farkas, Ruth L., Luxembourg. Confirmed by Senate, March 26, 1973. $300,000 post-April 7, 1972, total $300,000. Farland, Joseph S., Iran, confirmed by Senate, March 27, 1972, $10,000 pre-April 7, 1972, $12,300 post-April 7, 1972, total $22,300. Ferguson, Clarence C., Uganda. Confirmed by Senate, March 16, 1970. No contributions. Firestone, Leonard K., Belgium. Confirmed by Senate, April 10, 1974. $100,000 pre-April 7, 1972. $15,100 post-April 7, 1972. Total, $115,100. Fransheim, Kenneth, New Zealand. Confirmed by Senate, July 30, 1969. No contributions. Gerard, Sumner, Jamaica. Confirmed by Senate, March 20, 1974. $38,867 pre-April 7, 1972, total $38,867. Gould, Kingdon, Netherlands, confirmed by Senate, September 26, 1973, $100,000 pre-April 7, 1972, $900 post-April 7, 1972, total one hundred thousand nine hundred dollars helms richard iran confirmed by senate february eight nineteen seventy three no contributions hill robert c argentina confirmed by senate december nineteen nineteen seventy three seven hundred fifty dollars post april seven nineteen seventy two total seven hundred fifty dollars holland jerome h 
Sweden. Confirmed by Senate, February 16, 1970. No contributions. Humes, John F., Austria. Confirmed by Senate, September 24, 1969. One hundred thousand dollars pre April seven, nineteen seventy two, five hundred dollars post April seven, nineteen seventy two, total one hundred thousand five hundred dollars. Heard John G. South Africa, confirmed by Senate July twenty three, nineteen seventy, no contributions. Ingersoll Robert S. Japan, confirmed by Senate. February 25, 1972. $3,000 pre April 7, 1972. Total $3,000. Irwin, John N. France. Confirmed by Senate February 1, 1973. $50,000 pre April 7, 1972. $500 post April 7, 1972. Total fifty thousand five hundred dollars keating kenneth israel confirmed by senate june fifteenth nineteen seventy three three thousand dollars post april seventh nineteen seventy two total three thousand dollars kintner william r thailand confirmed by senate september twenty sixth nineteen seventy three no contributions Krabiel, V. John, Finland, confirmed by Senate March 26, 1973, $29,500 post April 7, 1972, total $29,500. Lodge, John D., Argentina, confirmed by Senate May 23, 1969, $200 post april seven nineteen seventy two total two hundred dollars macomber william b turkey confirmed by senate march twenty six nineteen seventy three five hundred dollars post april seven nineteen seventy two total five hundred dollars marshall anthony d kenya confirmed by senate december eighteenth nineteen seventy three forty eight thousand five hundred five dollars pre april seventh nineteen seventy two total forty eight thousand five hundred five dollars meeker leonard romania confirmed by senate july twenty two nineteen sixty nine no contributions melody thomas p uganda confirmed by senate june twelve nineteen seventy two no contributions Middendorf, J. William, Netherlands, confirmed by Senate, June 12, 1969, $2,000 post-April 7, 1972, total $2,000. Miller, Lloyd I., Trinidad and Tobago, confirmed by Senate, December 19, 1973, $25,000, post-April 7, 1972, total $25,000. Moore, John D. J., Ireland, confirmed by Senate, April 18, 1969, $10,442, post-April 7, 1972, total $10,442. Moynihan, Daniel P. India. Confirmed by Senate, February 8, 1973. No contributions. Newman, Robert G. Morocco. Confirmed by Senate, September 19, 1973. No contributions. Peterson, Val. Finland. Confirmed by Senate, May 1, 1969. No contributions. Plosser, Walter C., Costa Rica, confirmed by Senate, April 6, 1970, no contributions. Pritzloff, John C., Malta, confirmed by Senate, July 8, 1969, 
$1,000 post April 7, 1972, total $1,000. Replogel, Luther I, Iceland, no contributions. Rice, Walter L, Australia. Confirmed by Senate August 13, 1969. One thousand dollars post April seven, nineteen seventy two. Total one thousand dollars. Rivero, Admiral Horatio, Spain. Confirmed by Senate September eight, nineteen seventy two. No contributions. Rush, Kenneth, Germany. Confirmed by Senate July eight, nineteen sixty nine. Two thousand dollars post April seven, nineteen seventy two. Total two thousand dollars. Russell, Fred J., Denmark. Confirmed by Senate January three, nineteen seventy one. No contributions. Sanchez, Philip V., Honduras. Confirmed by Senate May seventeen, nineteen seventy three. No contributions. Schmidt, Adolf, Canada, confirmed by Senate, July 8, 1969, $1,000, post April 7, 1972, total $1,000. Scott, Stuart Nash, Portugal, confirmed by Senate, December 18, 1973, no contributions. Selden, Armistead. New Zealand, Fiji, and Tonga, and Western Samoa. Confirmed by Senate February 27, 1974. No contributions. Smith, Robert S., Ivory Coast. Confirmed by Senate February 8, 1974. No contributions. Strauss Hoop, Robert, Sweden. Confirmed by Senate April 25, 1974, $1,000 post April 7, 1972, total $1,000. Symington, J. Fife, Trinidad and Tobago, confirmed by Senate July 8, 1969, $100,000 pre-April 7, 1972, $500 post April 7, 1972, Total one hundred thousand five hundred dollars. Vaughn Jack Hood, Colombia, confirmed by Senate May twenty three, nineteen sixty nine. No contributions. Volpe John A, Italy, confirmed by Senate February one, nineteen seventy three. Two thousand dollars post April seven, nineteen seventy two. Total two thousand dollars. Watson, Arthur K., France, confirmed by Senate April 6, 1970, $300,000 pre-April 7, 1972, $3,000 post-April 7, 1972, total $303,000. Total contributions pre-April 7, 1972, one million three hundred twenty five thousand three hundred seventy two dollars post april seventh nineteen seventy two four hundred twenty two thousand six hundred ninety two dollars grand total one million seven hundred forty eight thousand sixty four dollars furthermore the committee's investigation indicates there are still a number of large contributors whose ambassadorial aspirations are yet unfulfilled. Six large contributors, who gave an aggregate of over $3 million, appear to have been actively seeking appointments at the time of their contributions. At present, 34 of 112, or about 30%, of all foreign envoy posts abroad are held by non-career appointees. The largest concentration of non-career ambassadors is in Western Europe, where there is also a high concentration of persons contributing $100,000 or over. Below is a list of eight Western European ambassadors and their contributions to the President's campaign.
Great Britain, Walter Annenberg, contribution $250,000. Switzerland, Shelby Davis, contribution $100,000. Luxembourg, Ruth Farkas, contribution $300,000. Belgium, Leonard Firestone, contribution $112,600. Netherlands, Kingdon Gould, contribution $100,900. Austria, John Humes, contribution $100,000. France, John Irwin, $50,500. Arthur Watson, $300,000. Ireland, John Moore, contribution $10,442. Total, $1,324,442. Senator Claiborne Pell, a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, said of the Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg appointments, and in this regard we ought to bear in mind that Benelux seems to be the most expensive place on which to be appointed, because Mrs. Farkas, who is ambassador to Luxembourg, and she wasn't appointed until her contribution had been put to the barrel head, even though an agreement had been received six or eight months earlier, contributed $300,000. Mr. Gould, who was not very forthcoming in his testimony, as far as his wife's contribution went, less than candid as i said publicly at the time contributed one hundred thousand dollars and mr firestone will have contributed one hundred sixty eight thousand dollars so it means that to be the ambassador to benelux will have contributed over a half million dollars substantially over a half million dollars and i think it is a poor practice the Caribbean posts of Jamaica and Trinidad Tobago were also popular with presidential contributors. Sumner Gerard, appointed to the Jamaican post in February 1974, gave $38,867, while Lloyd Miller, ambassador to Trinidad and Tobago since December 1973, donated $25,000. The two former envoys to these posts, Vincent de Roulet and J. Fife Symington each contributed $100,000, allegedly as part of an effort to obtain appointments to more prestigious ambassadorial posts. According to the FCRP, fundraisers interviewed by the Select Committee, they went to great pains to tell prospective contributors who might be interested in ambassadorial posts that there was no quid pro quo in exchange for any contribution they might give. Robert Gray, a public relations executive and a fundraiser in the 1972 presidential campaign who had been recruited by Maurice Stans, had a set speech when making solicitations in this context. Speaking of his solicitation of John Safer, a Washington, D.C. developer and sculptor, who gave $250,000 to the re-election campaign, Gray testified, He did tell me that he wanted to be considered for an ambassadorship. Over the years, I have learned the speech almost by rote, which I gave to him as I have given every time that the subject comes up and that is almost verbatim as i have given it that only the president can guarantee you that you can be an ambassador no one else can guarantee that you will be nominated to the senate other than he and that any contribution from any citizen can do no more than assure him or guarantee that those of us who are involved in the fundraising process will do our best to see that his name is among those considered and then he will be considered on the basis of qualifications at levels beyond ours gray communicated safer's interest in making a contribution as well as his interest in government service to stands apparently safer was also referred to herbert kalmbach who reiterated that his interest in an ambassadorship would be forwarded to the proper persons including maurice stands but that no quid pro quo could follow from the contribution. At the very least, a number of persons saw the making of a contribution as a means of obtaining the recognition needed to be actively considered. Thus, as noted below, 
Vincent de Roulet stated that he saw his contributions as one of three or four avenues available to individuals to obtain an appointment. In fact, one businessman, Roy Carver, chairman of the board of Bandag Incorporated, apparently saw a correlation between the size of the contribution and the extent of the anticipated recognition. Robert Gray testified that his public relations firm, Hill and Knowlton, had been retained by Carver to gain, quote, greater visibility on the Washington scene, end quote. As related by Gray, Carver later told him that he was, quote, anxious to be considered as an ambassador, end quote. Although Gray had given Carver his pat speech, Carver wanted to make contributions as a means whereby he would receive, quote, consideration, but not necessarily the appointment. Gray described his contacts with Carver. Mr. Dorson, was any discussion had between you and Mr. Carver concerning the amount of contribution? Mr. Gray, no, not at any time. My understanding is that he gave a heavy contribution in the end. The only thing that I know is that during the campaign he would call every so often to find out if I could tell him what other people had given, who was top money man at the moment because he, particularly in the final weeks, got very anxious that he be on record as having given more than someone else. I don't know if he ended up with that distinction or not, but he likes to be first in what he does, and he was determined in the final weeks to be first if he could. Mr. Dorson, did you communicate with him the amount that you thought would give him the highest contribution of the campaign? Mr. Gray, yes. At times when I could have found that out, I would pass it on to him. Mr. Dorson. How did you find this out? Mr. Gray. By calling Miss Arden Chambers, Stan's secretary, usually. Mr. Dorson. Did his desire to give the largest contribution in the campaign have anything to do with his desire to become an ambassador? Mr. Gray. With his desire to be considered an ambassador, yes, I am sure that it did. I cannot imagine that he would have given those kinds of monies without that belief. Mr. Dorson, did you and he discuss the possibility that he would give the largest contribution in the campaign would tend to increase the amount of consideration he would get for his, Mr. Gray, no, it was not that. The amount of visibility he would get, I think, is what intrigued him about the amount. On November 2, 1972, Carver gave Bandag Incorporated stock worth approximately $257,000 to the president's campaign. Although Carver received a number of State Department and White House interviews, he never received any appointment. In at least two cases, discussed in greater detail below, there is evidence that the articulated policy of the Finance Committee to re-elect the president not even to suggest the possibility of a quid pro quo to a prospective contributor was ignored by high-ranking White House and campaign officials. According to evidence in the possession of the committee, in two cases involving J. Fife Symington and Vincent de Roulet, Herbert Kalmbach, the president's personal attorney and the leading fundraiser on behalf of FCRP prior to April 7, 1972, appears to have made an express commitment for an ambassadorial post in exchange for a substantial campaign contribution. In one of these cases involving Symington, Kalmbach has already pleaded guilty to a violation of Title Eight, United States Code, Section 600, which makes it a crime to offer a government job in exchange for a political contribution. In a third case, involving Cornelius Vanderbilt Whitney, a $250,000 contribution was returned to Whitney in the expectation that he would have to testify before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and that the return would eliminate any suggestion that the anticipated appointment was related to a campaign gift. End of Section 8 Recording by Linda Johnson